Hello everyone, Sino-American relations, why China won't rule the world. So the relationship between the United States and China is probably the most important bilateral relationship in the world today. It certainly is the most important bilateral relationship uh, from the point of view of the United States. So what are some of the issues that define the relationship between the United States and China. And why did I subtitle this video, uh, Why China Won't Rule the World? Well, firstly, let me outline the issues, explain the issues, and then in the conclusion, I'll, I'll try to argue why China won't rule the world, as some have suggested that it would. So I'm trying to argue against that. So one of the first issues uh, in any conversation on Sino-American relations is the issue of Taiwan. China, whose population is closing in on 1.4 billion people, wants Taiwan back. And uh, it considers Taiwan part of its own civilization and part of its own proper political territory. However, Taiwan with a population of only 23 million people, uh, has been operating as an independent country since 1949, uh, even though by now most countries of the world do not officially recognize it as such. So they do not recognize it as an independent country. There's now, however, a distinct Taiwanese identity, and there's no desire at all on the part of many Taiwanese to unite with China now or in the near future. Now, among the scholars and even government officials in Taiwan, opinions vary. Some, in fact, do want to eventually uh, join the People's Republic of China, uh, but others do not. So th there is disagreement within Taiwan. Uh, the United States guarantees the factual independence of Taiwan because uh, the United States Navy is in the area, and so this is a source of friction for Sino-American relations. The second issue is the issue of Chimerica or Chimerica. Uh, this refers to the idea that China and the United States have become a single economy, even though polit politically they obviously remain two distinct countries. So. What happened here? China, in order to develop rapidly economically, uh, turned to export-led development. And this is a common theme for rapidly developing countries. Since the middle of the 20th century, we saw the same phenomenon in Japan. And we saw the same phenomenon in South Korea. And export-led development refers to the idea of a country becoming a major manufacturing base, a global manufacturing base, selling its products to much of the rest of the world, and thus creating industrial, fairly well-paying, steady jobs for its populace, and then developing from there. So China followed this model in the footsteps of Japan and South Korea, and uh, in order to maximize the effectiveness of this model, it wanted to keep its products as uh, financially competi competitive as possible. So in order to do so, it decided to buy huge quantities of U.S. dollars, thereby driving the value of the U.S. dollar higher relative to its own currency, making thereby making its products cheaper because Chinese workers have to be paid in local Chinese currency the yuan or the renminbi. So uh, as the Chinese currency falls relative to the U.S. dollar and therefore relative to other major world currencies, Chinese products are becoming cheaper. And um, what does China do with all these dollars? Well, uh, it basically lends it to the United States. China is a major lender to the United States government. Uh, and then the United States government spends that money. And this allows people in the United States to buy more of 
the goods that are manufactured in China to go to Walmart or uh, log into uh, to their Amazon account and buy cheaply made Chinese goods. So this this is how it works. As you probably know, the United States government runs uh, in in recent years consistently for the last twenty years or so r runs very significant annual budget deficits and the national debt uh, is twenty one trillion dollars as of nine as of twenty eighteen. Uh, because in recent years, the United States government has been spending about one trillion dollars more a year than it's been taken in. So, uh, China is a major lender uh, to the United States. So, this idea of Shy America was explored by uh, economic historian Neil Ferguson and also uh, by uh, ec economic observer uh, Zachary Carabell. So, uh, uh, the point here is that China and the United States are mutually dependent, and it's not clear who is a more dependent party in this relationship, because if China were to stop lending money to the United States, uh, the Chinese economy would collapse, since uh, China needs the United States as a market for the goods that it manufactures. Uh, in recent years, there's been a shift in China toward a more consumer-based economy. Uh, so um, uh, we'll see how it develops because the new president, President Xi, has taken an approach of uh, being tough uh, on the rich in some respects, and many millionaires have left China since he came to power in late 2012. China has a lot of ghost cities, and um, in reality, they're not completely ghosts. They're not completely empty. Uh, they're just significantly underpopulated. So you could have a city that's built for a million people with just 70,000 residents. Uh, ghost cities were built uh, with private money, and the infrastructure for them uh, with regional government borrowing. So private investors would... Uh, pay for, for the actual housing, they would make a deposit, a down payment for actual housing, but the infrastructure itself was financed by regional governments, and this led to regional governments throughout China being very deeply indebted. Ultimately, however, the national government of China cannot allow regional governments to simply go bankrupt, uh, so the national government is effectively on the hook for these loans. Uh, in contrast to these ghost cities, you have um, in, in many cities like in Beijing and Shanghai, housing that is uh, very expensive and in fact uh, there's not enough of it. And the Chinese relationship with uh, the United States uh, is complicated because of the issue of espionage. China engages in extensive traditional and cyber espionage against the United States in order to obtain economic and military secrets. China wants to obtain blueprints so that it could reverse engineer American products for itself. China is also modernizing its air force and especially its navy, and it wants uh, all the military secrets it can get, however it can get them. Uh, China is also not a democracy. Uh, that also puts some distance between the United States and China, although we clearly have demonstrated uh, throughout the centuries that uh, uh, we, we can deal with countries that are not democracies as long as they uh, tow our line and take our side uh, on global issues. Uh, but yes, that is a bit of a problem from our point of view, especially for the human rights community within the United States and the human rights uh, lobby in China uh, disregards uh, the will of the people. It's actually a more repressive version, slightly more repressive version of the Singapore model. So if in Singapore uh, the city-state was built uh, on, on the power of PAP, People's Action Party, and the party, while allowing nominally allowing competition, would actually dominate the whole system, by absorbing all talent into itself and by manipulating the process. So in China, there are eight political parties besides the Communist Party, 
they exist, but the Communist Party still controls everything, certainly at the national level. Uh, freedom of information is limited. The vast majority of people do not have access to Western-style social media like Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Uh, but uh, if you're willing to pony up around a hundred bucks uh, a month, which is a lot of money for for many Chinese, for millions of Chinese, that's uh, too much. A hundred bucks, not a, a month, a year. A hundred bucks a year is is too much for millions of Chinese. But it is possible to use VPN, virtual private network, um, to access uh, Western uh, social media. Now in China, the internet tends to be slow as it is, and if you use VPN, it's even slower. So yeah, there is a barrier uh, to information in China, definitely a barrier intentionally imposed by the government, making it harder uh, for people to get their hands on uh, unauthorized information. There is a harsh punishment for open dissent. Uh, but China tolerates criticism that is subdued and that is not direct. Uh, so that's how it coexists with foreign journalists and foreign scholars, uh, thousands of whom live in China. Uh, because if you want to be a journalist uh, writing about China or you want to be a scholar writing about China, you have to live in China, either permanently or for long stretches of time, because that's the only way that you really know what's going on. And uh, if you want to live there, you cannot openly attack the government. But if you criticize it a little bit, especially if it's in a foreign language publication, if you're writing in uh, English for the American audience, or in, let's say in German for the German audience, uh, Chinese people will, will not be reading, will not be buying your books anyway. And so the government, the central government doesn't care very much. So this is very different from uh, totalitarian regimes, let's say, of Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union, where no manifestation of dissent in any form was tolerated, and certainly no foreign scholars and journalists permanently living in the country or staying there for long stretches of time were allowed. I mean, that, that would certainly not be the case. But here you have many, many of them living in China and writing books and articles, very critical, of uh, the Chinese government and its policies, uh, but as long as the Chinese uh, people who do not understand English, uh, who do not read the books in English or in German or in French, as long as they don't get their hands on all that stuff, the Chinese government sees no problem with it. Uh, so uh, China also has a problem with the United States because uh, we keep priding them on minority rights. China has um, 55 officially recognized minority groups and they account for 8.5% of the population, which means that 91.5% of the population are ethnically Han Chinese. And the Han Chinese uh, dominate the economic and uh, political system of China. So minority rights are not well respected in, in China, and uh, we, we take a lot of opportunities to remind them as a government, but also as a society every once in a while, uh, if you pay attention to American politics, the, you know that um, some celebrity, usually some Hollywood actor, uh, every once in a while um, criticizes China, particularly on the issue of Tibet. Intellectual property. China steals intellectual property, not just from the United States. Intellectual property is very poorly protected. American television series and, and uh, movies are stolen. Partly this is the result of China's policy, which limits access to the Chinese box office, because the Chinese box office has to be majority Chinese. And so uh, that's done to promote the, uh, the Chinese um, movie industry. And China now actually makes more movies than the United States per year. Uh, but China still makes movies just for China and for the Chinese diaspora living abroad. Very few Chinese movies become blockbusters outside China's borders, uh, but American movies are very big in China. So China limits access uh, to its markets. And this is uh, also a point of tension between the United States and China. Quandary of North Korea. Uh, North Korea exists because China saved it uh, during the Korean War between 1950 and 1953. It saved it from being conquered by the United States and South Korea, 
and it cost China approximately 500,000 lives. Uh, China acted out of perceived self-interest because it did not want American troops on its border. So as the United States was overrunning North Korea and uh, its troops moving close to the Yalu River, the Chinese infantry uh, moved to counter it because the Chinese did not want American troops uh, on its border. So uh, North Korea essentially has been a buffer uh, for China against the United States and its South Korean allies. Uh, China has been um, assisting North Korea for decades without Chinese aid. The North Korean government and society probably would have collapsed some years ago. Uh, we know uh, that from WikiLeaks that China in principle uh, would be open to Korean reunification under the political system of South Korea and we've known it for a long time. I've known it for uh, at least eight years now. So North Korea is a delicate issue because it has nuclear weapons and as you know its uh, young leader Kim Jong-un can be pretty volatile and uh, hopefully the, the, there are signs that he is ready to uh, demilitarize at least party and get rid of some of his nuclear weapons and stop testing nuclear weapons. So we'll see what develops uh, as Kim Jong-un's leadership evolves and as President Trump's leadership evolves um, we'll see what happens but from the Chinese point of view uh, North Korea's demise has to be handled gradually and very delicately because should the government collapse abruptly uh, China is afraid that millions of North Koreans would pour across the border into China and this would be a humanitarian and logistical nightmare for China so obviously it wants to prevent that Another aspect of Sino-American relationship, and this is one that tilts the power balance, one of several ones that tilts the power balance toward the United States, is, as the scholar Barry Buzan put it, China has no friends. Now, I think this is a bit of an over-exaggeration, but it probably is justified uh, with some dramatic license. Uh, China has fought wars with many countries over the last several generations. Clearly, uh, war with Japan, 1937-1945, in which Japan, the empire of Japan, was the aggressor. Then the aforementioned war in Korea, 1950-1953, in which China fought uh, against uh, South Korea and the United States, and in fact fought them to a stalemate. Uh, Sino-Indian War, which India started in 1962, but which China finished. China won that war. That was a fairly limited engagement in the Himalayas over the disputed border, which still is in dispute. Uh, Sino-Soviet border conflict in 1969, in which the Chinese crossed the border, but the Soviets repelled them. And uh, as far as my understanding is concerned, that particular border dispute has by, by now been settled. And then the Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979, when China invaded uh, its long-standing uh, nemesis, Vietnam, in order to punish Vietnam for Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia and the overthrow by the Vietnamese of the brutal dictatorship of Pol Pot in Cambodia. And of course, the Cambodian government was the client of, of China. So China decided to pay Vietnam a visit. Uh, and after... A, rapid and significant advance into the Vietnamese territory, the Chinese began to take heavy casualties against battle-hardened Vietnamese infantry. Then they decided to declare victory, the Chinese, and leave. So they, so they left. Uh, China has active territorial disputes with India, Japan, Vietnam, and the Philippines. Uh, China, however, maintains, and this is where my disagreement with Buzan comes in, uh, maintains good relationships uh, with Pakistani military and intelligence. This has been a pattern for a long time uh, because China is wary of India and of course Pakistan is India's number one enemy. India and Pakistan fought four wars and uh, Pakistan lost all four. So Pakistan certainly looks toward other actors and especially now that you know a US-Pakistani relationship has deteriorated uh, a great deal uh, since the early 90s. Uh, so Pakistan is obviously looking toward other actors, most importantly China, to strengthen its position in the region. Also, 
uh, China has enjoyed improved relations uh, with Russia since the administration of the current president of Russia, Putin. And in Russia, this relationship with China is played up as a friendship. I'm not sure it's a friendship, uh, but uh, Russia calls it so because Russia wants to demonstrate to its own population that Russia has a mighty ally in China, and that alliance makes Russia standing even mighty, even greater in the world. And um, the popular misperception is that China, which is misperception that is promoted, actively promoted by the Russian government, um, it, it is that Russia and China will jointly destroy America somehow. Uh, but in actuality, China and Russia are very different culturally, and they have very different economic and geopolitical interests. So economically, China is so tied with the United States, they're economically one country. And at the same time, uh, economic ties with Russia are much weaker. Uh, and, and so China has no reason to see the United States disappear or to see the United States in decline. It wants the economic relationship with the United States to continue. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the United States' re economic relationship with Russia is really marginal. There's very little by way of trade, and such trade as does occur mostly goes from the United States to Russia, things like medical supplies, medical equipment. Uh, so uh, the Chinese interests are, in addition to maintaining strong economic ties with the United States, is the protection of its diaspora in the region, especially as uh, in recent decades uh, thousands of Chinese moved into Russia and stayed uh, permanently there as traders. Um, clearly, uh, Russia's and China's interests do not fully coincide. Uh, China has no forward operating military bases. That's another reason why uh, the United States has an upper hand in the Sino-American relationship and China has a problem with uh, aircraft carriers compared to the United States. So if you do not have forward operating bases, you cannot carry warfare effectively uh, far outside your borders. Um, so this is a problem uh, for China because the United States has bases or installations in more than 100 different countries around the world. Um, if you do not have forward operating bases, then you, the most you can do to carry war in distant, into distant regions, to project your military power there, is to have aircraft carriers. Well, China only has two, one of which is very suspicious. Uh, it's very dubious that it can be anything more than a training ship. Uh, China bought its uh, first aircraft carrier from Ukraine, uh, and it was a uh, actually old Soviet aircraft carrier uh, built in the 1980s, and it was not even finished. Uh, China sort of bought it, it refurbished it, and it launched it uh, only in 2016. So before 2016, China had no operational aircraft carriers at all. Finally, in 2016, they get this old uh, uh, Soviet suspicious aircraft carrier, and it could carry uh, no more than 24 Chinese jet fighters. Uh, but in May of 2018, China launched its second aircraft carrier, and this one was already built domestically uh, by China's uh, Dalian Shipbuilding Industry Company, and it still mimics that, see, that old Soviet design uh, of the first refurbished aircraft carrier that they bought. It's just a little bit bigger. It's a bit longer and a bit, bit wider, and the estimate is that it can carry between 32 and 36 uh, Chinese fighter jets. And uh, China hopes to launch its third aircraft carrier by 2020, and they're hoping to have a modern design. So uh, that would mean, we think, a nuclear-powered carrier, uh, because these two uh, carriers that China has now, they use conventional engines. They're not nuclear-powered, which limits their range of operation and limits the time spend that they can spend at sea. In contrast, the United States dominates the seas. It has 11 aircraft carriers, and the U.S. aircraft carriers are nuclear-powered. The newest uh, aircraft carrier called Gerald R. Ford can carry 75 aircraft. 
So you can see that in terms of aircraft carriers and forward operating bases, China is no competition for the United States. And then you have potential uh, problems that China can get itself into very easily, particularly because its current regime is very nationalistically oriented. Uh, so President Xi is very nationalistically oriented. Uh, Chinese diaspora lives uh, all over the world. Uh, there's at least 50 million ethnic Chinese living outside of mainland China. So, for example, in Malaysia, there are about 20% of the population. In Indonesia, 4% of the population. And in both of those countries, they uh, account for a significant portion of the economy and they make up significant economic elite despite their relatively small numbers which uh, has made in the past has made them, made them targets including targets of violence for example uh, the genocide in the late 1960s in Indonesia uh, by President uh, General uh, Suharto uh, China increasingly assert China is increasingly assertive foreign policy potentially launches it on the collision course with countries in the region that may not treat the Chinese diaspora as well as uh, the Chinese government uh, might hope. So nuclear weapons is another problem. China has hundreds of nuclear warheads. China and Russia are the only two countries with a definite capacity to strike the United States with their nuclear weapons. There are many other countries that have nuclear weapons, but uh, they probably cannot reach the United States. China can. Uh, China has uh, many domestic problems which will prevent uh, its uh, projection of power abroad. So whoever is in power in China, let's say over the next half a century or so, uh, is in, uh, left with the burden of taking care of cleaning up uh, these issues. And this will take a lot of money, a lot of personnel, and there, therefore, it will distract or divert from uh, foreign policy issue and attempts to dominate uh, the globe. So what, what are these domestic problems that will prevent China from dominating the globe? Uh, first is an issue of environmental pollution. China has some of the worst pollution in the world. It is forced to rely very heavily on the, on the most polluting source, fossil fuel source, which is coal. Uh, Indoor facilities have been built for children to play in major cities because it may be unsafe for them to be outside for an extended period of time. Uh, China lacks women because of China's one-child policy. Even though sonograms were um, forbidden, many Chinese prospective parents still got sonograms and disproportionately aborted female fetuses because of the preference for male babies. So there's already now a generation of young men in China uh, with not enough women to marry, which creates all kinds of social problems. Uh, HIV slash AIDS epidemic, prostitution, uh, labor migration flows, uh, growing labor unhappiness, hard working conditions, three refectory towns, uh, and as I mentioned previously, ghost cities, excessive regional government debt, and in recent years, particularly after 2012 capital uh, flight and brain drain. Uh, the Chinese uh, parents send their students to study abroad. First destination is the United States, followed by Canada and Western Europe. And uh, a lot of the Chinese were able to take their capital illegally out of China. There's a number of ways to do so, circumventing the Chinese legal uh, requirements. And so uh, this uh, portends, potentially portends, significant economic and social problems in China, uh, and, and uh, therefore it's not very likely that China will rule the world anytime in the foreseeable future. Thank you.